the leopard just sat there, froze, didn't move a muscle looking at us. Then suddenly it dropped down on all fours on its belly and it crept along the ditch and out of sight. And everyone just looked at each other in disbelief thinking, wow, was that real what we just saw? You say, well, I've seen this big cat, and some people just flatly refuse. They think that Britain's such a sweet little island, we shouldn't have predators that size. I heard this growl behind me, nothing like a dog's growl. And just like anything else in life, you're sat on your own there. I don't care who you are, how brave you are. Something like that will put the shivers up your spine. As she was walking before the cub came out, she flicked this tail. She literally flicked it in the air. And I simply could not believe what I was seeing. It was the most extraordinary feeling. It threw its head back, he said, and it made this sort of round. But when you actually realise that there are big cats living in Britain, it changes everything. Welcome to Big Cat Conversations. We speak directly to people who've encountered one of Britain's big cats. We also discuss the bigger picture. Why are unofficial big cats being seen and could these cats even be naturalising without us knowing? If you've had a big cat encounter in Britain and would like to discuss it, email me at rick at bigcatconversations.com. You can find other episodes on the website bigcatconversations.com. I'm Rick Minter, and thanks for joining me. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 12 of Big Cat Conversations. This is an audio podcast, but uh, this is a rare example of one we're putting on film as well, so you can see it on YouTube. Those of you watching it on YouTube, um, the other episodes are all going to be on the audio podcast, which you can get on Spotify and iTunes, Stitcher, etc., and through the BigCatConversations.com website. We're here at uh, part of Bristol Zoo. This is an outpost of Bristol Zoo near Cribs Causeway Junction on the M5 motorway. You may be able to hear the motorway humming behind us. And it's called Bear Wood at the Wild Place Project. It's about six miles west of Clifton, which is the main base of Bristol Zoo, for those of you who know that zoo. And this is a special place um, early on in its um, structure and created for... Um, former native British mammals. So um, in front of me is a wolverine enclosure, whether a male and female wolverine. Behind us are the lynx, which is our main focus of discussion today. In fact, right behind us in the centre of the picture is a male's den, and he's in there, and we've actually sort of um, zoomed the camera in and seen his head sort of uh, nodding around. He may appear during this um, session, uh, so we might catch him on the camera. And there's a female going around the perimeter path as well. And this is a, uh, um, this is a sort of oak mixed woodland, um, much like lynx would live in if they were reintroduced in Britain um, in the foreseeable future. Also around the corner are brown bears and wolves. And there is a plan to actually merge the wolves with the, bear, the bears and let them sort of coexist like they would do in, say, in Romania. Um, where they still exist in, in Europe at the moment. Um, so that's all part of what you can see if you visit uh, this part of Bristol Zoo at Bear Wood. Um, our guest for today is a rewilding expert, um, author of books, organiser of many conferences, somebody who influences the whole rewilding um, scene, uh, behind the scenes, um, uh, Peter Taylor. And we're very grateful for Peter coming on. Peter, thanks for joining us. Welcome. It's a pleasure. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. Great. Especially to see the link. Lovely, thank you. Um, we're going to be talking about rewilding, what does it mean, and reintroducing the links, what would that mean uh, if we did it for, for real in Britain in the near future. Um, even though we don't have an agenda on this podcast, it's here to discuss the ideas. Um, I think Peter is a firm advocate of, um, of uh, reintroducing the links with certain conditions, and we'll hear about that. But we're also going to have that discussion in the context of um, big cats being around already, so some 
People might call that spontaneous rewilding, some rewilding that's happened by human accident as a random event um, through past irresponsible events which have let the cats out. Um, before we get on to rewilding and reintroducing the lynx, we're just going to hear Peter's own experiences of big cat encounters. Um, so Peter, could you take us back a few years to when you sort of had a visit from the police, I think it was, for your first time, wasn't In, it? Indeed. 20 years ago, uh, my family, we, we used to camp uh, near rivers and near woodlands in West Wales, get all the uh, kids together. And uh, one camp was particularly wet and the river was very strong and noisy. Uh, in the morning, we had a visit from the police who was, have you got dogs? I said, no, we don't have any dogs. And I said, oh, they said, in the next field, seven sheep have just been killed, like overnight. I, well, we didn't hear anything. And normally dogs are pretty noisy. So I went with the, the coppers and... Uh, Six sheep had been killed and dragged and stashed under the riverbank. And one was still in the field. And it had uh, one leg completely stripped. So I look at the leg and when a big cat eats, it rolls the skin back. And then they've got sandpaper strong tongs and they strip the flesh. So it's just bare bones. So I, I looked at this and I thought, right, this is, this is not a dog, right? And I said to the copper, there isn't, there isn't a dog alive that could actually drag a sheep 100 meters, right? And he said, yeah, we know. We call them black pumas. So I had a look. I had a look at the, the six that had been stashed, all very neatly killed, except one which had been gashed even so deeply that the intestines were coming out. Well, a dog's claw can't do that. Only a, a, a real strike from a cat can do that. All, the, all of them had been neatly killed with a bite to the windpipe. And you could measure the canine difference. Well, I didn't know there would be a difference, but there was four and a half centimeters and then three and a half centimeters. So it's a mother. And uh, the young stay with the mother, panthers, leopards, for about 18 months. And same with pumas, I believe. So it's like, oh, right, that's why seven, right? <laughs> They're practicing. <laughs> so uh, I had a chat with the police, and, and uh, he said, yeah, my boss uh, once took a shot at, uh, that we don't do that anymore. He said, the last thing we want is a wounded panther. Uh, and we don't think they're a threat to the public. Now, I might kind of have a few words to say about that, but anyway, at some point, I rang uh, his boss, an inspector in Llenethly, and I actually got him on his mobile. He said, oh, we're out, we're out at the moment, armed response unit. He said, but, you know, we, we're, not, we're not aiming to, to kill these animals. Uh, and uh, we, we show, you know, we, we, we respond, uh, people who've, who've got their, have had their dog killed or whatever. So in terms of the animal's existence in Britain, uh, many uh, conversations with with the police, particularly. Um, we've got the the female lynx prowling directly below us. A marvelous place to to see. It's it's just incredible. Anyway, yeah, the camera angle can't pick that up. I don't think, yeah. but she's yeah. um, cautiously walking yeah. past. Yeah. Now, in in somewhere like California, you've only got to go a few kilometers north of San Francisco, and you see big signs in in the woods. Don't wander around, don't let your children loose, you know, they're big cats. And that's accepted. And every year, somebody gets killed. So it's, it's real. And, I uh, could dispute that, Peter, not every year. No, maybe not every year. Um, and but it can happen. My, ne my next experience was in uh, the Forest of Dean. Again, camping, family camp. And uh, I was uh, half asleep late at night. Uh, and my and my partner heard it as well. But I woke up and I thought, what was that? As if I was dreaming. And it, it, it sounded like a leopard's cough. I've spent time in Africa. They've been around our site, pinching our food. I do know what a leopard's cough is like, like. And I thought, I'm dreaming. Uh, and, but she confirmed it as well. She'd heard it. Now, strangely, I completely forgot until the next evening 
and it's getting dark, and where's all the children? Where are the kids? And I, oh, they're in the woods. Ah, maybe not such a good idea. And at that moment, the most horrific screaming. So my brothers and I, we run to find our, our oldest boy, who was about 10, 12, hanging from this fence. They'd gone over a barbed wire fence to explore um, some old mine workings. And they had torches. And my boy had seen a big cat with big green eyes, <laughs> really close. And he got all the other kids together. And then he, he tried. they all tried to move too quickly. He got stuck on the fence. He was terrified that the panther would eat his, his sister. And uh, they were really traumatized by it. And I just feel, and also confirmed much later, by the Forestry Commission, who were doing a, 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 a uh, infrared census. survey of the deer. And, and he actually went on TV. I remember the BBC interview saying, oh, yes, we have panthers in the woods. Mm. Um, we've seen them on the, on the videos. And I thought, wow, it's, it's news at last. Mm. But what happened, you know? Mm. That wasn't recorded. That, that wasn't sort of actually captured on film to, to repeat. It was just right. the thermal cameras at night yeah. when they were doing the deer yeah. sensors. Two out of the, they, it was every three years they would do it, and two, two, uh, two of those censuses in succession caught big cats on, yeah, yeah. on those thermal cameras. Yeah. But well, I, I personally think there should be notices up warning people to just say, big cats, uh, be careful. You know, that's part of being in the wild. Mm. And uh, mm. I, I'm personally, even though I, I think there is a risk, it's worth taking. Uh, and, and we can talk about why, you know, mm. why it's worth taking. But uh, mm -hmm. that's my own personal encounters. And I'm absolutely convinced, as a scientist, that they are, they are out there. And people who dismiss that out of hand are not looking at the evidence. Mm. And you've had personal friends several times um, relay reports to you? Yeah, I'm quite miffed in a way because I've never had a direct encounter. I would <laughs> love it. Um, <laughs> but friends have. Mm. And I would say half a dozen mm. and one or two have direct field experience of big cats. Mm. So they're not going to be fooled. Yes. And people don't get fooled by pussycats, you know, mm. when they go, that was awesome. Yeah. I was terrified. Yeah. No, you don't get scared by a pussycat in the woods, you know. Yeah. So these animals are impressive mm. and, uh, and they are elusive. Uh, but I'm absolutely convinced that, uh, that they're there. And, and one day maybe I'll be lucky. Yeah. OK, thank you. Well, that set the scene. And we'll now um, talk about rewilding, uh -huh. what on earth it means. And, of course, it, uh, when you read stuff about rewilding, often you get bored with um, paragraph after paragraph delving into the definition. So we'd better be quick and say what it is for sort of um, in, a, in a simple sort of yeah. minute or so. But yeah, yeah. I mean, can we just mention your books? I mean, you know, amongst things, conferences and yeah. speeches you've done um, and whatever, there's two books here. Yeah, Beyond Conservation uh, with the nice links on the cover. Um, that was really a review of everything that was happening up until 2005, over 10, 20 years almost, especially in, in Scotland, of all of those initiatives which were beyond the conservation paradigm. And there were many, and they had many different flavors. And so then we were also looking at where we could go with this. Mm. So that's about how people manage land for nature and wildlife. Uh, but particularly yeah. in the more innovative sense, yeah. breaking the mould. Yeah, 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 for sure. Being more creative. Conservation has a kind of, let's protect, it, it's conserve, and, and it's part of the old, whole development paradigm. You destroy and then you conserve what you've got left. Rewilding is, um, is more creative. It's more involving. And it's more future orientated. And uh, it doesn't need uh, a definition. The academics are very keen to define it. Yeah. And, and also, there's, a, there's a, a, a part of the spectrum of rewilders that would like to claim it and say, no, this is rewilding. It's got to be big scale. You've got to bring big charismatic animals back and maybe a little safari lodge and a bit of a business, you know, and all of that. I'm not against that. It's just that it's not the whole story of rewilding. And this other book, which is uh, 2011, I mean, it's thick. It's 400 pages. 
and it has about 12 initiatives in Britain which are all different different forms of getting the land different forms of land ownership different forms of cooperation you can rewild a local river you can rewild your garden uh, the scale is not the important thing the important thing is the experience the important thing is to be creative it, it, it reconnects to nature there's something new happening mm -hmm. and that's why it's such a buzzword that's why it's capturing the young mm -hmm. And but it, uh, Peter, it yeah. does mean less constraints on nature, less of our agenda, less of less targets, less sort of closely manicured nature. Um, it, this is a, a wilder ecosystem in the full sense, and people being able to experience that. So, work yeah. for wildlife benefit and people's benefit. Yeah? yeah, absolutely. And unfortunately, I mean, this is not everywhere, but conservationists sometimes put up the most resistance because they are managers; they like to micromanage. And uh, you, sometimes you go into a, a, a nature reserve and, and you see evidence that people are managing it. It's almost like they have to show you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't like over-interpretation. And, uh, and there has to be a certain risk involved in nature. When you're a kid and you're exploring a wood for the first time and you're like six years old, it can be risky. Uh, and so that's part of it, the, the, the frisson of risk. Mm. So when you're even a grown-up and you're in a forest and you know that there's big stuff in there which can, can give you a hard time, you're more humble. Uh, you know you're not the top creature in there. And, and it's a different experience and it mm. doesn't have to be just you know, tigers in, in, in India, for example. Uh, you have to be very careful around some... some some animals here, you know, deer, for example. Mm. Uh, yes, re re red yeah. deer, and so even a, mu a, mun a muntjac um, buck can be feisty, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Peter, you would excuse some micromanagement sometimes in nature reserves for a butterfly species or something that's um, particularly rare and precious, yeah. would you? I mean, the, the the management level depends on the scale. If you've got a big enough area, you can let things happen. You can let the river find its own course. You can let a wildfire happen, a wind throw, you know, all of those things, all of those natural processes. And if it's really big enough, you can have predators along with the herbivores. By the time you get to most of our nature reserves, which are really quite small, uh, then yes, you know, there's, there's management. And even with the big areas, if they're successful, the, the, the big animals are going to breed, they're going to wander, you get a really harsh winter, they want to migrate a little bit, then it's like, mm, you're going to have to have management. And uh, so it's not about no management. That, mm. that, 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 mm. That's kind of not realistic. Uh, but as little as possible and with as little human imprint as possible in some areas so that you just get that feeling of the wild. And what we're talking about here f for rewilding, for me, it has to be something inside us humans that gets rewilded, whatever we're doing. Because mm. without a shift in consciousness... <laughs> that's, the, that's the male emerging, that's is it? That's the male, yeah. Yeah, he, he's more spotty than the female. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so he's just woken up and come out, has he? Anyway, he we've got him on camera, I think. Lovely. So, yeah, I mean, you s it's amazing, really, because you don't see these. I've been in these animals' territory many times, y and you don't see them. And one student of mine saw one. I was really quite miffed. <laughs> yeah, but we like are at a zoo, Peter. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, <laughs> this is it's great. Even though it's a zoo, it's it's really nice to see an animal like that uh, with its own little den and everything. You know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that? this isn't the wildest place, obviously, but it it's kind of moving people towards that hey you know these animals could come back here we 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 could bring them back mm. and uh places they can visit um i mean uh, in terms of recommending places that sort of have a essence of rewilding ennerdale in the lake district is a great place isn't it it's a great place particularly for um, our producer owen is pointing to something um i guess oh yeah he's, he's right di he's directly there behind yeah, the tree lovely yeah, yeah, I like Ennerdale very much because uh, they rewilded the river, 
and uh, that it was it was not such a difficult job because there was really only one farmer and he was on board right uh, in the whole valley and so it's like uh, they get very precious about their fields and some of these fields have been there hundreds of years if not longer and the idea that you're going to let the river destroy your field you know it, it's ancestral so this was quite a step forward but a, a group of us and you were there we were watching that river as it was changing because there'd been a big storm and it, it, it imparted something it's like oh this is nature taking its own course right instead of being hemmed yeah. in by the walls and so on mm. and interestingly in that catchment they do not have flash floods go over the hill and they had serious flooding trouble largely because the rivers are canalized and there's no forest to absorb the water and so on mm. so rewilding can be in some sense restoring uh uh, a bit of resilience to to an ecosystem yeah. nature's own engineering which yeah. is for free and a dale is, yeah. is worth a visit because they're restructuring the forests because there are a lot of plantations um they're reducing the grazing on the hills so you've got new growth of dwarf willows and uh juniper uh so the plants are coming back and we haven't quite managed to persuade them to go for the beaver yet, but it was close. It was close. Um, and they've even got um, cattle in the woods. That was a big step. Put cattle in the woods. Cattle in the woods, said the farmer. And okay, they, they're not really seriously wild cattle, which you, you, can, you can get from, mm. from Holland, surprisingly. Mm. Um, these are belted Galloway, and they'll, they'll come when you whistle. Um, but it's it's a wilder wood, you know. Mm. It's mm. it's a different place. And uh now recently projects like that don't like to use the word rewilding because of various publicities in in relation to journalism and so forth, uh the farmers are up in arms. They don't want rewild they don't understand rewilding, they don't want it. And they think it's all about wolves coming mm. back. Mm. These are perceptions coming are, in and yes. the baggage that yes. we have. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. So for England and Wales, I, I wouldn't be advocating the return of the, the lynx, the wolf, or the bear. There isn't, there isn't a space. However, in Scotland, there's a lot of space with a lot of deer, overpopulated deer, trashing the forest, and not a lot of sheep farming. It's perfectly possible to have the lynx there, and even I would say the wolf. I'm not sure about the bear. It does need a lot of space, the bear. Mm. Uh, and bears, they are dangerous, much more than wolves. Lynx are not dangerous, but bears yeah. are dangerous. Yeah, yeah. So could uh, we mm. get on to the, to, to the lynx, um, Peter? Um, why did you put a lynx on the front of your book on uh, sort of rewilding or beyond nature conservation? What, what is it about the lynx that's the, the prime candidate for reintroduction? Um, well, first of all, it, it's not a threat to humans, uh, so you don't have that problem. Um, secondly, it's a very charismatic animal, and the charisma is it's not something conservationists think about, right? Rewilders do. Uh, you're wanting these creatures back because uh, they do something to us, you know. The lynx is a very secretive animal, and it, it has this, this element that it looks like it's always smiling, and it knows things, right? You talk to Native Americans, they call it the keeper of secrets. This is the bobcat or the Canadian lynx. Yeah. Yeah, well, mm, yeah, yeah mm, Canadians mm, in the north mm, and the bobcat mm, further south. Mm, um, keeper of secrets, mm. you know. Um, and then the wolf. The wolf is highly revered amongst indigenous peoples as a, te as a teacher. I'm sure we, we learn as a hunter in the early stages of, of, of our evolution we learned a lot from watching wolves and domesticated the wolf mm, mm. Uh, to help us. So we have this close relationship to wolf. And uh, bear, we revered. Uh, bear was uh, uh, in many ways uh, the, the keeper of dreams and uh, because they go away and they sleep a lot. And, uh, and so 
you know, even Arthur, King Arthur in, mm. in the legend, Art is the bear, it's the Celtic bear. So he was the bear king uh, from a bear clan when we were clannish people, you know, mm. the Celts. So that kind of reverence for nature and the fact that you can learn something from it, uh, I, I think that's an essence. It's, it's a part of rewilding. Yeah. Uh, I have friends on the continent who are bringing back bison, for example, mm. uh, the wild horse. Yes. Uh, and, uh, of course, the wolves and the bears, not so much the bears, the wolves are definitely moving. They're on the move. Yes. They're absolutely. in Holland now, yeah. Belgium, Denmark, uh, France. Mm. And being monitored. monitored um, and the, the impact on the, on the red fox yes. uh, around them, you know, where, where yeah. they are yeah, is yeah. interesting. Yeah. That's being yeah, observed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that might be one day an argument for the, for the Welsh farmers to hear. You have less foxes if you have lynx. Mm. And and lynx, they don't really bother sheep very much. Mm. They like to stay in the forest. Mm. So if you've got a, enough forest, they're not going to wander too much. Mm. Mm. Um, so in fifty years' time, Peter, if you had your your wish, what what would you like to happen about lynx reintroduction in Britain? What would you like to have been the outcome of of it happening? Perhaps I'd like there to be an official release program. Uh, uh, as you know, people see lynx especially where near where I live in the Mendips. There's mm. a long history of sightings. Yeah. Uh, so they are here, but I'd like them to be officially welcomed. It, it would be what, what we would call a shift, a, a shift of consciousness, mm -hmm. particularly amongst government. Uh, and I, I would like that to start in Scotland so we get the experience of it where it can't be too controversial rather than somewhere like the Kielder Forest, which is a good candidate, but is surrounded by sheep farmers. Mm -hmm. And like, and in Wales, whoa, you know, it's even difficult to get the beaver, let, mm -hmm. let alone uh, the, the, the lynx. Mm. But in 50 years' time, I'd like to see uh, core areas in one in Welsh national park, Snowdonia, uh, one English national park, either the Lake District or North Pennines, uh, and in Scotland. Mm. Um, w core areas where the principles of rewilding are to let nature do its thing. Mm -hmm. So no economic use. And uh, that, that w there are areas in, in uh, Snowdonia that you could do that with, mm. maybe about a third of Snowdonia. We're not talking about the whole of... Wales, you know, upland Wales, as the French, far uh, the Welsh farmers are worried about. Mm. So but there would be, li you say no economic mm. use, but there, you're not advocating no livelihoods. There would be livelihoods for people there would be, associated with this. Well, it, it's all of the major European national parks have core areas. And, of course, people come for that. Mm. And then there's accommodation, uh, there's, there's school parties, uh, there's, there's education, a whole, there's a whole wilderness experience. And in yeah. fact, in Wales, the sheep farming community is a relatively small part of the economy. Mm. The tourist economy is much bigger. Yes. And so it's, mm. it's a question of cultures, shifting yes. cult cultures. But Peter, you have to be careful how you do this because I remember on TV a program showing how about um, uh, bringing the brown bear back into parts of the Pyrenees, which has been very controversial. Um, and this apiarist, this beekeeper guy with his community, w was interviewed, and the bears had trashed his uh, hives. He'd lost all the money from that. He had had no introduction and welcoming to the reintroduction program, no training, no, and he mm -hmm. had no compensation yeah. for those impacts. Now, that is not the right way to go about things, no, is it? To leave no. people stranded and uncompensated for impacts from these animals. Yeah, well, I think one of the principles of rewilding is... Uh, particularly in terms of um, initiatives that's, that mm. begin. It, it needs to come from the grassroots upwards. There are rewilding uh, schemes which start from the top down. People look and go, oh, that's a nice area. They've no contact with the local community and they'll come up with a plan and a consultation and all of that. Um, but the best rewilding, and it's certainly he here documented, starts with local people, local champions, people who know each other. And they start to look at, well, you know, maybe we could buy that mountain 
uh, or that valley. And, uh, and that's w w when people are taking responsibility mm. and setting the pace uh, and, uh, and having no targets and definitions and so forth. Mm. So again, and, and also those schemes, they involve kids. Kids collecting seeds, creating a tree nursery, going out there and planting trees. You know, so there's a, there's a social movement involved in, in rewilding, mm -hmm. which is not readily quantified. Mm. Uh, and all of that is actually, yes, economic. It's jobs. It's, mm. it's uh, uh, you know, a big shift. Yes. So I'd like, in 50 years' time, I'd like to see one such area in Wales, one such area in England, one such area in Scotland. So, Peter, rewilding happening for real and, and reintroduction programmes, very important that you do it softly, slowly, take communities and all kinds of stakeholders with you. Nobody left out, nobody disadvantaged. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And ideally, coming from the local community, that's real rewilding. You know, pe yeah. People who belong and have a feeling for mm. their area and, and, and what it can be. Okay. And and then they start talking to other people, and the process starts. Yes, so their amb it's a process. Yeah, their ambitions, their potential, yeah. what they see as the. And and what happens then is that you might, for example, the, a conservationist or a forester might say, "All right, we'll take the aliens out. You know, the the big giant Douglas firs, right? And we'll have the oak back." Then the local people say, "Well, we like them," mm. and so it's like. Oh, well, maybe we won't take them out. I mean, they'll be gone in two or three hundred years. Yeah. So that's what happened in Ennerdale. Yes. You know? Yes. Or and we'll so park that decision. We could do yeah, it yeah. 20, 30 years' time if people want yeah. to. We don't have to yeah. do it now. Yeah. Because Instead some people the, don't want to. The purists and the definers and, and so forth. You know, yeah. They're, they're not part of rewilding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, we mustn't be too hard on our friends, Peter. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we'd better get on to the context of big cats being h here for real. So we've got some black leopards here, we're very sure about. We've got some uh, puma conchalus and pumas, yeah. mountain lions here. Yeah. Uh, we've got some lynx here. Yeah. Um, in fact, I remember a farmer on Exmoor saying, when we were talking about lynx, she said, you should have heard the pointy-eared ones going at it all day on my neighbour's <laughs> farm. So I, I presume she meant lynx were breeding on yeah, her yeah, neighbour's uh, farm. So, yeah, so what yeah. do we do about that? You know, that's what you call spontaneous rewilding or spontaneous yeah, reintroduction. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. does that sort of muddy the waters a bit of rewilding? Or Well, the only way in which it muddies the waters, uh, in my experience, is you, you have people who are... There's no way that they're going to even agree that such creatures exist. It doesn't matter how much forensic evidence you show them, they'll ignore it. Because it's not politically correct, uh, and it will damage their reputation. And we had to think about that uh, within the conservation community, which I used to belong to, I still do, um, about reputation. I mean, it's like UFO territory, you know. And then you have people writing that maybe they're an interdimensional phenomena, well, no. How did the sheep get stuck up in the tree? You know, that's a leopard, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, what what are the challenges? Well, the challenges are if it's officially recognised, then some people are going to want to hunt them down because they're alien. Ninety percent of our countryside is alien. Ninety percent of the food chain is alien, right? So I don't have a problem with leopards being here and eating the muntjac. And they're doing what lynx do anyway, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and in my experience, both the police force and even the farmers uh, have accepted them. Uh, so, yeah, they have a role to play. Mm. Uh, and people, the people who have encountered them are transfixed. They're, they're different people, actually. So there is that element to it uh, yes. as, as, as well. Having said that, Peter, I mean, I have met some people and I'd like them to come on the show one day, but um, they are a little bit reluctant. I've met a few people who have been traumatised. Uh, but having said that, they are still very sensitive and protectionist about the cats, yes. but they've had a traumatising experience. It'd be up too close and, yeah. you know, yeah. too close for comfort. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that that's, that's also happen. something about the big cats. I remember... Uh, reviewing a book about the return of the puma to areas in Colorado and a young guy, a jogger, 
very fit, healthy. He'd been uh, killed. Mm. Uh, and uh, his parents at the funeral said he would have regarded this as a holy death. Mm. And we do not want the authorities to start persecuting the big cats. Yeah. The Beast in the Garden is the book. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting book, yeah. So, I, and that, uh, isn't it common that people say, oh, I, I don't want them hunted down. I, yeah. I think they should be here, you know. Mm. Mm. But um, it's back to your point about risk as well, isn't it? Yeah. The proportionality of risk, the types yeah. of risk. Yeah. yeah, Whether risk makes you a better person because it yeah. heightens the senses and yeah. makes you more Yeah, makes you, more hum- makes you a bit more humble. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And let's face but, it, yeah. we as a culture are in deep trouble globally. And it's, it's all to do with our relationship to nature. Mm. We have got to change. We've got to shift our consciousness. Mm. And so rewilding and accepting a bit of risk, accepting a bit of economic damage, mm. if, we, if we make that an example mm. to the rest of the world, it will it will go some way to conserving the tiger and the lion and you know really serious risks yeah uh, so i'm i i think we've got some there's 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 a value in having these panthers in the yeah. woods uh, can i just take you back to the economic damage can i suggest we rephrase that to just different economic opportunities so it's back to yeah. livelihoods there are yeah. livelihoods associated with this that, surely. that's right yeah. and generally i think the data show mm. that there's 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 as many if not more livelihoods mm. uh, in ecotourism and wildlife watching and mm. this story has been repeated with whales for example hunting mm. the whales or watching the whales uh, ospreys in scotland mm. uh, i i think with uh a wild territory, even though you, you're not going to see a lynx as easily as we ca- we can here, um, but you can hear wolves. <laughs> yeah. So I, I I think there is a you're right. There's an economic uh, potential mm. for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're running out of time, so I'd like to get on to our word of the week or our words of the week. And for this episode, it's intraguild predation. Mm. Bit of a bit of jargon, but mm-hmm. that means. The bigger critter, yeah, taking out the little, taking out critter. the little ones, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this could be an argument for the Welsh farmer, you know, because the lynx they predate foxes, yeah. Uh, but this, it's a bit like would would the lynx, if we reintroduced it and had more of them, would it kill our domestic cats? Or um, uh, I mean, the lynx when when um, the lynx died out in Britain. It's reckoned that the the European wildcat, the Scottish wildcat, as yeah. we call it now, di- uh, spread its distribution because yeah. it wasn't suppressed. So, yeah. do they yeah. suppress? Does a bigger one suppress a smaller one? Apparently, they do. Yes, yes, yes. And so, in that s- in that sense, it could be overall beneficial to. I mean, farmers lose mm. far more to foxes yeah. than that they would probably ever lose to to lynx. But would our, would reintroduce lynx have to watch the black leopards and pumas that are here already? Or would if they just I were there, I would. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, not that they would see them coming. Yeah. <laughs> One ambush predator uh, against another. Um, but, yeah, I, I think this dynamic, especially in, in our countryside, we wouldn't know how it would play out. Mm. But it, it's going to be some, there's going to be some kind of dynamic going yeah. on because uh, you're right. The bigger the predator, the, the the more suppression that goes on of others. You know, it's like mm. the wolf suppresses the coyote. Uh, yeah, and there are all kinds of knock-on effects from that. Yes, you know? yes. As part um, some of that's called trophic regulation, isn't yeah, it? The, the yeah, way that yeah. you know a fox will yeah. a- avoid a coyote, um, and coyote will avoid the wolf. In and um, yeah, so yeah. they they have different sort of distribution yeah. and eating habits in yeah, America yeah. where that happens. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, it would be a nice problem to have intra guild. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. Peter, anything finally you want to say? Because we are running out of time. Um, I mean, quickly, what do you think about big cats in Britain being here already in a, in a, in a minute? Well, for me, it, 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 it's it's very special. You know, it, it's it's like, uh, wow, how did this all happen? And um, it's, a, it's a funny one because nobody ever sees spotted leopards, right? They're always black. And the puma was sandy colored. So that if it was imagination, somebody would be seeing tigers or spotted leopards or even lions, right? But no, that doesn't happen. And so the, do- the dogs react and the horses yeah, react, yeah. so they're so seeing where them too. In the, where in the world would that happen naturally? 
and you, you you're going to sort of Guatemala or, or wherever where you you've got uh, there you've got the jaguar the black jaguar mm. and the puma and uh and so i don't know i i feel more at home with the the kind of indigenous feeling you know when these animals are around you know and it's uh, um i d- i'm 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 excited mm. by them being here um and uh, the opportunity that we might embrace them as, as as a bit of a risk. Great. Thank you so much, Peter. We're going to have to close it because we're going to be thrown out of here in a minute because <laughs> the zoo's about to close and it's getting dark anyway. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry if we picked up a chainsaw in the background, but we are in the British countryside and yeah. uh, I would recommend thoroughly, and we were biased because we're here today and they've been very good to host us, but we'd recommend this part of Bristol Zoo, the, um, the Wild Place Project. It's a step forward. From the bars and the cages, isn't it? Yes, really, you know. Yeah. 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 So I'm sure the animals would like to be able to hunt something, but <laughs> <laughs> they're very well fed, I'm sure. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Peter, for joining us on Big Cat A pleasure. A pleasure, Rick. Great. Thank you. Okay, ju- and just to say, for next episode, we will um, be hearing from a case in Lincolnshire where uh, we have two guests, uh, and there's been... Um, feral domestic cats being predated there by what seems to be a puma we'll be hearing from two local guests in lincolnshire for our next episode so hope you can join us then thanks for watching and thanks for listening everybody all the best for now